you're visiting tonight, let me tell you and assure you, I am not Pastor Bob. But he uh, asked me, since he was going to be out, if I would be willing to teach tonight, and I consider that a, a great uh, responsibility as a great privilege, so it's good to be here with you. We're going to continue in the book of Galatians tonight, uh, picking up in chapter 4, uh, verse 12. If you want to take your Bibles and turn there, <clears throat> I have not been able to uh, be a part of the, the Bible studies since he started Galatians, so I'm not sure of everything he said last week or in the previous week, but tonight as we look at uh, beginning in verse 12, Paul's tone actually changes from uh, the tone he had previously or in the previous chapters, he, he quits being that professor or that attorney de defending a point to becoming more, um, I guess you would say, more personal. In fact, uh, many theologians will, will tell you that verses 12 through 20 of, of chapter 4 are probably the most personal uh, verses that Paul has in all of his writings. And so with that in mind, uh, or please keep that in mind, and uh, it also teaches us something, I, I believe, that as believers, you know, there are times when we, when we have to defend our faith. There are times when we have to speak to a sinful situation. And in doing so, we need to make sure that we always or never forget that we have to show compassion and we have to show kindness. Um, it's not one of those situations where we have to shove our beliefs, if we can say that, down someone's throat. Uh, you know, it has been said that you catch uh, more flies with honey. And so, uh, you know, as we think about those times when we do have to defend our faith, we do have to uh, deal with a sinful situation, we need to make sure we remember to be, to be compassionate, uh, to be kind uh, in that dealings. So, as we get started, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, Paul writes, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you. Now, we're going to stop at that point because, uh, again, many theologians will say that the last half of that verse actually belongs with verse 13. And so, we're going to stop there on verse 12. But as we look at that, Paul is appealing uh, to his brothers and he's begging them to recognize and live in the freedom that they once knew. And the, actually the freedom that all of us as believers have. <clears throat> His actual words, I beg of you, become as I am, can, can, be, can be related really to uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 19, where Paul stated, For through the law I died to the law, that I might live to God. Okay? I'm sure you've heard it from Pastor Bob many times on many occasions in the past. The Galatians, they had come to Christ, but yet the Judaizers had come into the church and began to tell them, well, you need to add something else. You need to add the, the legal system uh, that you as, a, uh, as, a, as the Jews had kept for so many years, and you need to add that back to uh, your freedom in Christ, which in essence caused them to lose that freedom. So as we look here, Paul is saying, you know, become as I am. And how was Paul? Well, he turned from the law and found the freedom in Christ. So as he said, so that he could live to God. And you and I need to realize we cannot live by the law any more than we can be saved by the law. All right? Now, Paul's appeal was also personal because he, he said he had become as you are. Become, he had become as the Galatians. Well, what did he really mean to that? Mean about that? Well, when Paul came to Christ, if you, if you remember, he was heavily entangled in the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish religion and the legalism there. Uh, Philippians 3, 5 and 6, if you wanted to glance over there. Paul tells us, he says, uh, he was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. 
as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So, as we look at that, Paul is basically saying, here's what I was. And I left that. And I've not been back. But yet the, the Judaizers, as we'd said before, have come into the church at Galatia and had persuaded many of the believers to go back into Judaism some. Okay? Now, as you think about that, you and I may think, well, that, that's, how, how could they do that? How could they go back into that? Well, think about some of our lives, what we've come out of. Think about, and I, I've done this with the, in a life group before, how, how easy is it for us to uh, go down that envelope and check those boxes that says, I'm present, I read my Bible this week, I studied my lesson, I'm giving. And when we check those boxes, we're thinking, I'm a pretty good person. I'm doing really good. You see, it would be easy for even a, as believers today for us to get wrapped up in a religious legalism. So as we consider the Galatians, we need to realize we're, we're not that far from them. We could easily fall into that same trap. Now, also as we consider this, we need to remember that the Jewish believers knew exactly what Paul had given up. Because many of the Jewish believers at the church at Galatia, they had lost their families. When they, when they came to Christ, when they left Judaism, they lost their families. Some lost their jobs. Some lost their homes. So they knew that when Paul said, I had become as you, they knew that Paul as well had lost some things in his life. But yet, they were now being intimidated by the Judaizers to return uh, to, the, to their former, former way of life. And uh, <clears throat> let me ask you, has there ever been something that you've tried to walk away from? It may be a habit. I've got uh, a good friend who used to be involved in, in drugs and alcohol. And uh, I've sp spoken with him about the, the draw of those things. Now, I realize this may, you may think, well, this is a poor comparison. But in one, another sense, it's not. Because, you see, many times we are still drawn to go back to a former way of life. Just as he is at times drawn to go back to that former way of life. You know, he, 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 can, he said he can close his eyes and just in a little bit remember the feeling of a drug high. And you know, and, and you and I, we came out of a lost world. Some of us grew up in church but we're lost for many years, even in church, thinking we were good folks. We were, we were good. We were going to heaven until one day God opened our eyes and we saw that we were lost and without Christ. And so I, I have to ask, as, as we consider what the Galatians are dealing with, do we find ourselves going back sometimes or desiring to go back to a former way of life? Because let's be honest, it's, it's easier to, to live by the check marks than it is to live by faith. It's easier to know, to say, give me a list of what I need to follow, what I need to do, rather than spend time each morning or each day with the Lord, living by faith, getting our instructions from Him, Again, easier to look at the list. So as we think about the Galatians and, and their pull back into a former way of life, we've got to be on guard that we don't fall back into that former way of life also. Well, let's move on. Second part of verse 12, where we talk about the reminder. Reminder. 
Paul gives, gives them a reminder. He says, you have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? Now, <clears throat> Paul refers to an illness as his reason for actually being there the first time, but yet he's not specific on what the illness is. Many theologians will tell you it was possibly malaria. The, uh, the country just south of Galatia, Pamphylia, I believe it was, uh, it's more of a swampy land, and many believed he may have uh, contracted malaria. And so he then went to southern Galatia to kind of recover. That is, that's the thought of some. But he had no plans actually to go to Galatia. And so uh, as he, uh, he tells them there, you know, I came to you because I was sick. And, you know, a couple of things to remember about this is that, first of all, illness to the Jews, many times was a sign of divine judgment. If you were sick, it's because you had done something wrong. And so, but as we see here, the Galatians had accepted Paul. Jews and Gentiles alike had accepted Paul. They didn't look on his illness as being a divine judgment. Uh, they, they accepted him. And as we see how Paul dealt with them, he, he continued on and he, he said... Uh, you did not despise me or loathe me. And as we, we think about those words, uh, remember that uh, they did not have good, good medicines at those times. And so what they tried to do is just bandage them up uh, the best they could. And many times uh, there was a stench from their, their illness, which would cause people to basically look at someone and and not want to be with them. And, they, and so Paul said, you did not despise me or loathe me. And the word loathe is another word for contempt. And so many times when people encountered someone who was sick, they would basically say, God's put his divine judgment on you. And so uh, I don't want to have anything to do, to do with you. And in fact, I'm going to spit on you uh, in my contempt. But Paul says, you did none of that. And so as he continues on, he, he says, uh, you received me as an angel or a messenger of God, even as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? He says they would have plucked out their eyes. But verse 16, he he comes back and says, Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? See, Paul knew exactly why their attitude had changed. He knew the Judaizers had come in and they had changed the mindset of many of the Christians in Galatia. And so his, his question was, you know, why have you changed? I'm still the same one, but yet because I've confronted you with this truth, you no longer care for me. In essence, you no longer love me. What happened to that love? Well, he knew, again, it was the Judaizers. So, going to verse 17. He says, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner and not and not only when I present, when I am present with you. Again, Paul in verse 17 reminds them the real enemy is the Judaizers. The, the term translated seek carries the idea of a, a serious interest in someone and was often used of a man courting a woman. So in essence, Paul was saying the Judaizers talk like they really care about you. But they are false suitors who have no genuine concern for your welfare or for you yourself, or any interest of you. 
And uh, one of the marks of a false teacher, uh, as, as Warren Wiersbe points out, is that he tries to attract other people's converts to himself and not simply to the truth of the word or to the person of Jesus Christ. He tries to draw people to himself. Not to mention any names, but think about some of the, uh, we'll, call it, we'll say television pastors, preachers that we know of today. Would you consider any of them to fall in this category? Some may, some may not. But folks, one of the ways to make sure you, you spot a false teacher is that they're drawing people to them and not to the Word of God and not to the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? The only interest the Judaizers had uh, in the believers in Galatia were to once again get them involved in legalism. And so as we see here, Paul's opposition to the Judaizers was because they opposed the, the saving work of Jesus Christ. They did not want the Christians of Galatia to be unbound, to experience the freedom of Christ. They, they wanted to bring the legal aspects, the legalistic work of the Jews back in. And, uh, and so his, his true opposition, opposition was to them. So what was Paul's desire for the Galatians? Verses 19 through 20, Paul's desire for the Galatians. He says, My children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Now, as we look, children, that, that's a term of special affection. And uh, the Galatian believers were extremely dear to Paul. Uh, but they were acting like infants, refusing to be born. You know, we could go back to the book of Acts in, verse, in chapters 13 and 14 and see where Paul, on his first missionary journey, actually started the church in Galatia. And so we know his heart for them. We know that his desire for them was, was to actually come to Christ and then grow in Christ. But yet, as he found after he left, the Judaizers moved in and again started leading them astray. Now, when Paul says, I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, don't necessarily believe that, that Paul is saying you need to be born again or need to be saved again. The word formed carries the idea of essential form and refers to a Christ-like character. In other words, Paul wants them to grow in Christ. He wants them to, to reflect Christ in all that they do. You know, uh, actually, in Colossians 2.6, Paul wrote, As you therefore have received Christ the Lord, so walk in Him. One of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 29. Paul wrote, For whom God foreknew, and he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. See, not only for the Galatians, but for us today, God's goal for us is to look like Jesus Christ, be formed into the image of Jesus Christ, reflect Jesus Christ, so that when people see us, they see Jesus. That had not happened at the church in Galatia. Paul had led them to Christ, got the church organized, had to leave. The Judaizers had come in and once again had began entangling them in the legalism that they lived in. And so we see in, in verse 20, basically Paul's saying he's at his wit's end. He says, how do I remind you of the truth that you had accepted previously? You know, he wants to come to them again so that he could speak to them eye to eye. I mean, ha have you ever dealt with someone, maybe talking to them on the phone, texting back and forth, emailing, trying to get a point across, and they just don't get it? 
and you think, if I could just sit across the table from you, if I could stand in front of you, then maybe I could explain it to you. Well, that's where Paul is. He said, you know, I, I don't know what else to say to you. You know, for, for four chapters, as we see them, Paul has, has been trying to explain and show them where they're at. And it's as if they just don't get it. And so uh, Paul says, you know, if I could be present with you, then maybe we could get this straightened out. Well, <clears throat> what does Paul do? He changes his tactics a little bit. Okay? He goes back once again to the Old Testament to begin to show them the difference uh, uh, between living under grace and living under the law. Let's look at the two covenants he talks about in verse 21. He starts in 21. He says, Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the, Jerus but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Okay, before we continue on that, let's, let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Beginning in chapter 12, we see the story of, of Abraham. Abraham is 75 years old. And is called by God to go to Canaan. And God promises him many, many descendants. But again, Sarah was barren. All right? Then, and Abraham was 75 years old at that point. At, at the age of 85, the promised son that God had said would come has not arrived. And so Sarah becomes impatient. She suggests that Abraham marry Hagar, her maid, and try to have a son by her. Now, this was legal in their society, but it was not in the will of God. But Abraham followed his wife's suggestions and married Hagar. At the age of 86, Hagar is pregnant. Abraham's a daddy. And Sarah's not happy. She's jealous. Things are so difficult in the home that Sarah throws Hagar out. But again, the Lord intervenes, sends Hagar back and promises to take care of her and her son. Then at the age of 99, we see it in Genesis chapter 17, God speaks to Abraham and promises again that he will have a son by Sarah and says to call his name Isaac. Then at the age of 100, 100 years of age, the son is born. We see that in Genesis chapter 21. They name him Isaac, as God commanded. Isaac means laughter. But something happens on that arrival. See, Isaac begins to create problems in the new home because Ishmael, the son that Hagar had, has has a new rival. For 14 years, Ishmael had been the apple of his daddy's eye. And now he's got a rival. At the age of 103, it was for Abraham, it was customary for the Jews to wean their children at about age three and to make a great occasion of it. At the feast, Ishmael starts to mock Isaac and to create trouble in the home. Well, there's only one solution. Hagar and Ishmael have to go. So uh, 
They leave. Sarah had told Abraham she's going to have to go. Abraham prayed about it, and God said, do as she says. We see that in Genesis chapter 21, verses 9 through 14. So, that's kind of the story. So, what's the, that have to do with the covenant, the two covenants? Well, you have a chart there. And we have... Hagar, and we have Sarah, all right? Hagar is a bond woman. She's a slave, all right? Sarah is a free woman. We know Hagar had Ishmael. Sarah had Isaac. Ishmael came. I write from the flesh, but it's man's plan. Okay? Isaac came from the promise of God. Hagar represents covenant of the law. Okay? Sarah, the covenant of grace and faith. This might be a little problem for some of you to see. Then we go on, and Paul mentions Mount Sinai. He also mentions Jerusalem, the present Jerusalem, I should say. And then he mentions the new Jerusalem here. He once again is trying to use what they know to help them to understand the two covenants of what they're dealing with. All right? Again, they're familiar with this whole story. And so as he points out the story again, he's reminding them that the, the covenant of law is basically man's... Can, will turn out to be man trying to fulfill the law. Can't do it. But as believers, we experience the covenant of grace and faith. Mount Sinai, the law given there produced religious slaves. The descendants of Hagar... And Ishmael, they moved into the desert desert area south and east of the promised land. They became known as Arabs. Mount Sinai is located in what is now known today as the Arabian Peninsula. And you see, it, it was between the sons of Hagar and Sarah that the modern Arab Israeli conflict began some 4,000 years ago. And of course, we still have that continual conflict. Kind of makes you think, why didn't they just 
wait on God. Now, it's also obvious that, that Jerusalem, uh, you know, why is Jerusalem there? What happened in Jerusalem? Well, remember, that's where, where Jesus was crucified. That's where he was, came and they crucified him. They did not accept him, did not accept the work that he did. And so, in essence, they rejected Christ. So that's why the present Jerusalem is under the, the law of, or the covenant of law. The new Jerusalem, heaven. It's what you and I as believers get to experience because of grace and faith. Now, in uh, looking at our, our scripture, we see where Paul actually quoted Isaiah 54, 1, when he said, Rejoice, barren women, or barren woman who, who does not bear. That was originally written to uh, the captives, the Jewish captives in Babylon, but here it's applied to Sarah. Some theologians will say it's also applied to the church because it takes... Uh, it, none of this would have happened without grace. And so Paul finishes up the chapter, and he says, And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So it is now also. Hear what he's saying. Ishmael basically persecuted Isaac. As believers, we need to realize that we're going to be persecuted. I shared with my life group Sunday morning that uh, I've talked to several people and, and many believe that in the next 10 years, Christians will come under greater persecution than we ever had in the past here in the United States. The church, I'm talking the big C, the church in the east, places like China, North Korea, they look at the church in the west and say we're weak because we've never been persecuted. We've never been, really been under trial. And so they actually pray for us. But according to, to some folks who know more than I do, they believe that the church, as we know it today, will come, come under greater persecution in the next 10 years than we've ever experienced in the past. And so the question will be for us, what do we do? How do we handle it? Do we go back to a former way of life so that we don't have to feel that persecution? That's what the, some of the Christians in Galatia did. They went back to a former way of life to escape persecution. But verse 30, Paul says, But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. And it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. So what's the application as we look at this? First of all, we are children of promise, okay? I mean, God sent His Son to die for us. And so by faith, we, we ask, ask that, make Him our Savior. And we become an heir. We become a, a son of God. And, and remember last week, as the pastor shared about what it means to be a son, 
Even though you're, you may be female, you're still a son because a son receives the inheritance. Females do not. So Paul was saying all of us are sons of God who know him. But we're children of the promise. Also, as believers, we are set free from the curse of the law. When you think about the curse of the law, what comes to your mind? Well, first of all, all those things you have to do to stay right. Jesus said there's no way that you can do that. There's no way we can do that. So we're under grace and so we're not under the curse of the law. Also, we are under obligation to live faithfully for the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 1, and I realize Pastor Bob may cover this even more next week, but I want us to look at that just briefly in a few minutes we have left. He said, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not subject again, be subject again to, the, to a yoke of slavery. Now, the yoke was an instrument of bondage. I mean, many times when we think of a yoke, we think of oxen being put in a yoke. Well, when that happens, who, who guides the, the oxen? The farmer. He's back there pulling one side or the other. He makes them go left or right, makes them stop, makes them go, all with that yoke. So when you think of the yoke, realize someone else is in charge. And so as we look at this, Paul reminds us, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. What was the slavery? The slavery of the law. He actually gives us two warnings here. One's a positive. I would call it a, a positive encouragement. Because he, said, he reminds us, first of all, that we were set free in Christ. And therefore, keep standing firm. Stand firm in the freedom that we have. But then there's the negative where he says, don't be subject again to the yoke of slavery. And as we consider these things, we have to ask ourselves, are we a slave to anything besides Christ? Because Jesus himself said, take my yoke upon you. Did he not? He said, I'm easy, the burden's light. And so we can really contrast the two yokes. The yoke of Christ, which is li living in the freedom of Christ, living in victory, in the victory of Christ. Or we can compare it to the yoke of slavery. Where we're bound by the law, where we have to keep the law, where we have to keep making checks in the box to make sure that we're right, even though we can't check every box. So the question is, whose yoke are we wearing? The yoke of Christ? Or someone else's yoke? Realize if it's not the yoke of Christ, it is the yoke of slavery. Where are we today? Are we walking in freedom? Or are we walking once again in slavery? But let's pray and we'll be dismissed, all right? Father, thank you once again for your love for us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us and and God, thank you that you have set us free. God, I realize that there are some who take that freedom and abuse that. But Father, if 
if our relationship with you is what it should be, God, we are walking close to you and honoring you with our lives. So, Father, I pray that uh, as we leave here tonight, we'll be honest with ourselves and decide whose yoke we're actually wearing. And that, Father, we will choose to wear yours and honor you with our lives. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.